Before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you guys know that the candle shop, Knox Investa, has finally launched. So if you're looking for beautiful candles that have a nice clean burn to them and are environmentally friendly, luxurious, and are sourcing really, really ethical and sustainable ingredients, make sure to go to noxvesta.com. That's N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A.com or on Instagram, N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A. Now, we've talked about ITT Tech in a previous episode, and many of you brought up, what about the art institutes? For-profit colleges are everywhere in a massive variety of fields. Sometimes they skirt by, just barely being legal. Whereas at other times, it's incredible they weren't caught sooner when they barely bothered to hide some incredibly shady, questionable, and yes, illegal activity. Today, we're focusing on the latter. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Corporate Casket. Today, we are going to be taking a look at the Art Institutes or AI for short. Instead of a handful of for-profits, we're going to really laser focus on the EDMC, the umbrella that the Art Institutes as well as a few other colleges hide under. So let's get into it. According to the Pittsburgh Press, the Art Institutes began in 1921 in Willis Shook Studio with only nine students. Originally, it was called the Artist League of Pittsburgh, but within two years, the name changed to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Shook himself received his education at Horatio Stevenson School at Pittsburgh. The Art Institute of Chicago, a separate entity from the ones he'd create, as well as the Yale University School of Fine Arts. After directing the school up until the late 1960s, Willis retired and passed away in 1983. However, in those later years, he didn't own the school anymore. He sold it in 1962. His grandson, Willis Shook III, claims that. While managing the for-profit institution, my granddad's utmost priority was always dedicated, hands-on, top quality personal instruction rather than attempting to maximize profits. But not all of his successors maintained his order of priorities. Some apparently quite the reverse. And frankly, this is why I'm extremely skeptical of for-profit institutes in the first place. The priority is often money as opposed to education. And while I can't really speak to Shook Sr.'s intentions here, the reputation under Shook seemed largely positive. One 1948 article talks about how they were entering their 28th year as one of the largest art for business schools. They claim to offer practical courses in advertising, illustration, photography, drawing, fashion, dress design, millinery or hat making, and interior decoration. Although this article doesn't say when exactly, they also say that recently the Art Institute added a postgraduate year to its course in advertising illustration. The school seemed to run almost like a family business. Willis Shook Jr. served as assistant to the director and placement manager from the late 30s to the 50s and traveled throughout Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio as a speaker for the school. In the late 30s, the school was located on the third floor of the Stanwix Shops building at the corner of Penn Avenue and Stanwix Street, and the artist Vincent Nesbert, who joined the faculty in 1928, ended up staying there for 25 years. At the very least, this shows that they had a more than qualified professor there for quite some time, even though he was a bit tough. It's said that if he thought a student's drawing wasn't good, he'd erase it and tell them to start over. Nesbert was known for painting murals at the Allegheny County Courthouse, which he completed while he was teaching at the Art Institute in the 30s. The school even turned out quite a few notable artists as well, such as award-winning watercolorist Frank Webb, who attended the school in the 40s. Tom Wilson, a cartoonist for the Ziggy comic strip, graduated from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh in 1955. Rick Calabash, also known as Rick Snyder, who's worked on multiple Disney films, is said to have graduated from the school as well as science fiction illustrator, Frank Kelly Fries. Whether or not these artists got to where they were because of the connections and techniques they got from the school or because of their own creativity and hard work or more likely a mixture of the two, I can't say for sure. Either way, this was definitely a nice feather in the Art Institute's hat. And generally speaking, they were a legitimate educator. The Art Institute of Pittsburgh was praised for decades. Their graduates were successful and as far as I could find, there weren't any complaints about them from this era. Maybe those complaints got completely buried, but generally speaking, problems didn't seem to arise until they were bought out. So let's see what changed at the art institutes when they changed hands. In 
In 1962, Willis Shook sold the school to Earl Wheeler, the founder of the Earl Wheeler Finishing School, as well as the Pinkerton Secretarial School. Now, this didn't last long at all, and articles just tend to sum up some of these years by calling it various changes in ownership, because it wasn't until 1970 that the Art Institute had its new official owner, and that was the EDMC, or Education Management Corporation. I'm sure there's some of you that are already cringing at the sound of that name, because it sounds like a homegrown local studio getting swallowed up by a massive corporation that doesn't actually care about the mission of the founders. And honestly, you're not entirely wrong to feel that way, but we're gonna keep it moving one step at a time. Robert B. Knudsen, who played an instrumental role in the transition, was named president at EDMC in 1971, whereas John Johns, an unfortunate but hilarious name, was named the school's president in 1970. Johns had graduated from the school and was considered one of America's top caricaturists at this point, so he seemed like a good candidate to run it and to hold on to that original mission of helping budding artists. Plus, the art institutes still had great teachers on hand, like Thomas Helwig, known for his watercolor and keeping in touch with his students after graduation. Bill Cockrell, who had experience working for KDKA-TV and Donesk Light, joined in staff in the 1960s, and Sandra Van Dyke became the school's first female president in the 1990s. I know that's a pretty massive time jump, but really nothing incredibly noteworthy took place until the 90s. Early that decade, EDMC began developing a culinary arts program and launched the School of Culinary Arts at the Colorado Institute of Art. Then they offered an Associate of Applied Science degree in 1993, an 18-month or two-year program all about fine dining and Assignments Restaurant, a fully operational restaurant for on-the-job training in 1995. That same year, EDMC purchased two more schools from the Ray College of Design for just over $1 million, and a year later, they bought the New York Restaurant School for almost $10 million. They even started offering certificate programs for legal healthcare specialists and administrative assistants in Atlanta, and the Art Institutes in Minnesota and Los Angeles opened up in 1997. By the end of the year, they had revenues of almost $200 million. And according to one source, in consultation with professionals in computer design technology, EDMC began to formulate new educational programs and launched three new degree programs for internet marketing and design in June, 1999. The company offered a bachelor of science degree in online media and marketing, which involved classes on business strategy and online advertising. EDMC also launched the program at the Colorado Institute of Art and planned to extend the programs to several other schools after government approval. The Art Institute of Phoenix offered a bachelor's degree in game art and design, including character animation and complex mapping and modeling. An associate degree in multimedia and web design involved interactive design and technical elements, such as audio, video animation, still pictures, text, and data. EDMC planned to offer the latter program in Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, Fort Lauderdale, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, Phoenix, Schaumburg, and Seattle. By the end of the fiscal year, June 30th, 1990, in 1999, revenues at EDMC reached $260.8 million. And I won't go on and on and on endlessly about their finances. If you wanna see those numbers again, sources are available. But the point is they had steady, massive growth, and that's really what I wanna make clear here. Several years in a row, it was 20% or higher, and in 1999, it was 30%. More and more programs became available, tuition was raised, the Art Institute definitely wasn't some nine student studio anymore. And I've got no problem in general, but for a lot of companies that end up on a corporate casket, it's right around this sort of growth or expansion period that the original mission tends to get lost in translation. From what I can tell, Shook truly wanted this to serve a specific community and offer the best of the best education he could to those students. I'm not saying everything was perfect, but it seems like for a school offering a culinary education, you'd think that EDMC would know the phrase, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. In this case, it feels like they were offering a ton of different certificate programs, but I have to wonder if it was really a help to any community or if it was just to maximize profit. Many sources mark the year 2000 as when the growth really became even more noticeable as they entered the online market. Patricia Sabatini wrote November 3rd, 2000 issue of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and said the following. Education Management Court, the downtown company that runs the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and about two dozen other post-secondary schools across the country will continue to try and boost enrollment through acquisitions in cutting edge programs, such as virtual classes over the internet, its chief executive officer said yesterday. EDMC launched the Art Institute online as a pilot project for students in Fort Lauderdale and Phoenix last fall. This fall, the program is being offered to students nationwide. Students can take selected courses online or start working towards a bachelor's degree in graphic design or a certificate in digital web design to be covered entirely over the internet. They also started offering bachelor's degrees at nine more of its art institutes over the last year, including the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Until a few years ago, its schools were limited by state regulations to awarding non-degree certificates
certificates and two-year associate's degrees. Knutson said roughly 30% of the company's more than 26,000 students are enrolled in bachelor degree programs. The market is calling for it, he said. In other words, the company saw a gap in the market and with new regulations allowing them to start offering degrees online, they were eager to begin offering that. Now, I'm not going to say you can't get a degree online or that the school should only take place in person, absolutely not, but it is easier for shady and questionable schools to saturate the online market, that's all. And I am saying this in context of a pre-COVID world. I understand now with COVID, nearly everything is online, so the rules have changed, but back in like 2000, this was a totally different animal. And around this time, the Art Institute didn't stop buying up other schools either. In 2001, they acquired Argosy, another chain of colleges. According to my sources, Argosy started with the Illinois School of Professional Psychology in 1970, founded by Michael Merkowitz. Then in 1976, he became the founding chairman of the Argosy Education Group, which acquired the University of Sarasota and six years later, the Medical Institute of Minnesota. And I know this is a ton of names, but the main takeaway here is that the Art Institute had quite a lot of companies and different schools or whatever under its belt. I can't go over the peak history of every single school it owned or it would be here for a while, but at their peak, they owned and operated over 100 schools through several divisions. That included Argosy, the Art Institutes, Brown Mackey College, and South University. The Security and Exchange Commission said that the Art Institutes were naturally focused on creative professions and took up over 50% of EDMC's student base. Argosy focused on psychology and behavioral sciences and had about 20% of their enrollments. Brown Mackey focused on vocational specialities and South University focused on health sciences and business disciplines, and each one represented about 14% of enrollments. And all of this growth in the early 2000s really paid off and made EDMC extremely profitable. So much so that in 2006, when EDMC was sold, it was the largest buyout in the for-profit education sector in history. Providence Equity Partners and the private equity firm of Goldman Sachs bought them out for $3.4 billion cash. According to the New York Times, the deal comes as Congress have repealed a law that forced all accredited schools to deliver at least half their courses on a campus instead of online to qualify for federal student aid. The change in law is expected to be a boon for companies like education management because it can now aggressively expand its market online learning programs, a market that analysts say is poised to explode. Education management now educates only 4,000 students online annually. Despite the potential for growth, the commercial education industry has been tarnished by allegations of fraud in some parts, though not at education management. In May, John P. Higgins Jr., the Education Department's Inspector General, testified that 74% of his fraud cases involved for-profit schools. And we will be getting to that fraud in just a moment. EDMC may have had a squeaky clean reputation up until this point, but it wasn't long before that changed. So now that we've got a pretty good feel about how the Art Institute came to be and what EDMC owned, let's take a look at where it started to go wrong. And before we start to dig into the beginning of the downturn, let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. It's that time of year when our schedules all go into hyperdrive. I'm spending more time with friends and family and still working an intense schedule. So am I eating right? Well, actually, yes, partially in thanks to HelloFresh. That's because HelloFresh simplifies meal planning with recipes and ingredients that cut out grocery shopping and limit meal prep time, giving you more time to spend the festive season with family and friends. And HelloFresh is offering all of the delicious goodies. There's over like 60 different recipes to choose from or something insane like that. And don't forget the favorite here on the channel, firecracker meatballs. Don't care what vegetable they put with it. I will eat it all the time. And they have a ton of options from vegetarian, calorie smart, and gourmet options. So there's plenty of variety for everyone in your household. And don't forget their app is super easy to use. It's probably one of my favorite features of HelloFresh is just how easy it is for me to organize meal prep. Don't send a box this week, send a box that week. Like it's so easy through the app. I don't have to talk to people, favorite part. So make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash casket14 and use code casket14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. That's up to 14 free meals and three free gifts at hellofresh.com slash casket14 when you use code casket14. And I have got to say this week has just got some of my favorite sponsors because this episode is also sponsored by Stitch Fix, my sweater god emporium center. Now, many of you know that style is an incredibly personal thing. You not only have to find clothes that fit your style, but they also need to fit you and fit the moment. So why not shop at a store that's personalized to your fit and style? Well, 
Well, here I am introducing Stitch Fix Freestyle if you haven't heard of it yet. It's a shop built just for you. It doesn't matter if you're looking for a specific brand that you love, or maybe you wanna try a new one. At Stitch Fix Freestyle, you can shop a range of over 1000 brands personalized for your fit and style. Stitch Fix is one of the main reasons why my sweater addiction has probably gotten so bad, especially as the weather is getting colder and I'm not really gonna stop, but it's also been the company that helped me find one of my new favorite pairs of jeans. Like I have been going through jean hell and they just sent me jeans one time and I was like, oh my God, this is it. I don't know if they meant that or not, but it meant a lot to me. So get started today by filling out your style quiz at stitchfix.com slash casket. That's stitchfix.com slash casket to try Stitch Fix Freestyle. stitchfix.com slash casket. Now, at first, things seemed better than ever. Between 2007 to 2009, their net revenues more than doubled from $1.3 to $2.9 billion. And in 2009, they went public again, receiving further hundreds of millions of dollars. One source says that arguably they had too much money, making them ripe for a takeover. They started buying shares back to avoid this and were overall in a great position. Sure, there may have been a small drop in enrollment here and there, but I think it's pretty safe to say that they weren't really hurting. However, cracks were very slowly starting to show. For example, in 2007, whistleblowers said that EDMC's marketing materials deceived prospective students by falsely inflating job placement statistics. The two whistleblowers were named as Lynn Toya Washington and Michael T. Mahoney, though plenty more have spoken out and confirmed those accounts. One former employee, Jason Sobeck, told ABC News in 2012 that they manipulated the job placement rates by counting students working in a job that they did not need a degree for. In my opinion, it's a wretched fraud. And we've seen this with ITT Tech as well. The promise that you will find a job when you leave their campus and the implication that it's their degree and their education that gets you there. Not only is it fraud, but it's kind of extra despicable when you consider that many people got these education in hopes of finding success during a failing economy. We saw this with the pandemic too. Online for-profit schools are notorious for taking advantage of desperate people. EDMC continued to thrive during the recession despite their misrepresentation, which is a bit messed up. Yet, though this lawsuit from the whistleblowers was filed in 2007, it took eight years to actually be resolved. And most articles I found on the topic were from around 2011 to 2015. I'm not saying that no one noticed the case for years, but it definitely didn't seem to get the attention it deserved for a long while. And we'll return to the suit the whistleblowers filed against Brown Mackey, one of the EDMC branches. But for now, let's talk about a few more that were filed against Argosy not long after this. In 2009, 15 psychology students at Argosy University said that the school didn't get its American Psychological Association accreditation in time for their graduation. According to the Courthouse News, students at the Dallas school say Argosy promised that the program was in process of obtaining APA accreditation, but say Argosy never even took the initial steps to apply for accreditation. The students say they can't transfer their course credits to other accredited Argosy schools located around the nation since the Dallas program was unaccredited. In their complaint in Dallas County Court, the students say a newsletter published in November 2000 called the school's lack of progress towards accreditation rumors. They say the school promised they would be grandfathered and considered to have graduated from an APA accredited program because the APA was scheduled to perform a site visit during their enrollment. By the spring of 2008, the school hadn't just refused to take steps to be accredited, but the site visit never even happened. And these students were essentially stuck with a worthless degree. It takes 10 seconds of Googling to learn that in order to be licensed to practice, psychologists need a degree from an accredited school. Argosy did not leave the news quickly though. In 2010, PBS aired a program called College Inc. all about education for profit. And they named Argosy for making deceptive or questionable statements. More and more people started stepping forward with their own experiences until by 2011, the Florida Attorney General was inundated with complaints. Eight out of the 183 were about Argosy. And just as things were starting to look bad for Argosy, Brown Mackey once again found itself in the news that same year when another lawsuit was filed against them. Apparently recruiters didn't just misrepresent job opportunities, but they'd be rewarded with free trips to Mexico and Las Vegas for meeting student enrollment quotas or goals. And if auditors or accreditors showed up to the EDMC offices, employees would hide posters that showed these goals and sales target prizes. And I'm all for incentivizing workers in a sales position to some extent. Salespeople are going to be a bit more pushy so long as commissions exist, and that's part of the game. But as we saw with ITT Tech, and as we're seeing right now with EDMC offices, this is why I really don't think expensive education and salespeople should mix. But don't worry, I have not forgotten about our main point of contention here, the art institutes. And people were taking a look at them too, especially thanks to Sergeant Chris Pansky, a retired Iraq war veteran featured
featured in the film, Educating Sergeant Pansky on Frontline, a PBS documentary series. Within this movie, he enrolls into an online photography program at the Art Institutes and PBS writes. He was nervous about whether he'd be able to cut it. He suffers from a traumatic brain injury caused by a car bomb blast in Iraq and post-traumatic stress disorder. He says the school told him he'd be taken care of and not to worry, but after struggling with his classes, he eventually flunked out. Shortly before our June broadcast, the Art Institutes told Frontline that they had readmitted Pansky. But last week, Chris formally withdrew from the school, stating in a letter that being a student at the institution will not yield a gratifying and successful career as a photographer. He also cited what he felt was a lack of disability services. And I don't think I really need to clarify how much of a massive PR blow this was when people learn that your supposedly convenient school is not accommodating to disabled veterans. I can't truly know if the Art Institutes did all that they could or not, but either way, this was yet another controversy and questionable act to add onto the growing pile of concerns about EDMC. Now, this next section about the lawsuits is going to be a whirlwind, and that is a fair warning here. From 2012, up until the dust started to settle, there were so many lawsuits, controversies, and shady practices that were uncovered. We're going to stick to as much of a timeline as possible here, so let's go ahead and start with their declining numbers. Around this time, in 2011 to 2012, the government issued a gainful employment rule that would judge whether programs offered by for-profit colleges actually present students with opportunities. And it seems like they didn't go into effect until 2012, yet it was later blocked and rewritten. Obviously, these rules would make things a hell of a lot harder for EDMC to operate. While that was a concern, the US Department of Justice was also breathing down their neck at this point, alleging False Claims Act violations. So it's not looking good. And don't forget, we've still got all those other unsettled lawsuits from earlier that were pending at this time too. One of the first ones to be settled was in 2013 against Argosy, the civil claim suit that accused them of deceiving students about their employment prospects. Attorney General Jan Zlavistan in Colorado said that our investigation revealed a pattern of Argosy recklessly launching doctoral degree programs without without substantiating or supporting that they led to the advertised outcomes. Recklessly launching degree programs. Yeah, that sounds pretty accurate when you consider how they basically tried to offer every degree under the sun. Not only was EDMC not picking one thing and doing it well, but they picked everything and this kind of ruined whatever they touched. Deceptively marketing their psychology program is you know, one thing that they couldn't really get out of because the issue kind of seems pretty black and white there. EDMC couldn't make any sort of argument against the student's effort here when it was their responsibility to at least have their own program accredited or be transparent about their status. Neither of which happened by the way, so hey, they lost the case. But this was just a drop in the bucket compared to what was about to come. This case was only settled for $3.3 million, but it set the scene for all other lawsuits against them. EDMC knew in simple terms, that they were absolutely fucked. According to the Post-Gazette, EDMC started trying to restructure their debt and they weren't making the money they used to either. The article reads, education management has struggled financially as enrollments have declined. This spring, EDMC posted a net loss of $468 million for its third quarter, which ended on March 31st. It is also facing a potential federal court trial next year in a multi-billion dollar whistleblower case filed over its recruiting tactics under the False Claims Act. That case was joined by the Justice Department and five states. EDMC tried to prepare for the storm coming, but I'm not sure anyone could have possibly weathered this. Finally, all their deceptive practices came back to haunt them. The state of Indiana joined in on the whistleblower lawsuit against Brown Mackey in 2011, alleging that the for-profit company EDMC received more than $12 million in financial aid, even after making false claim promises and misrepresentations to the state. California, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Montana, New Jersey, New York, New Mexico, and the District of Columbia were already parties to the suit. By the time it was settled, they had to pay about $100 million. As the Justice Department explains, they were essentially running a high pressure boiler room. Admissions personnel were paid based on how many students they could enroll. They'd lie about job opportunities, accreditation, anything to make the sale. Around the same time, Brown Mackey also settled the other 2011 lawsuit, promising to reform their recruiting and enrollment practices and forgive about $5 million in loans. But when you actually break this down, it only adds up to around $1,400 per student that qualified. So sure, it's better than nothing, but it hardly seems like genuine justice for their acts in systematically defrauding students and taxpayers. Plus 
throughout all of this, there was no remorse or acknowledgement of wrongdoing on EDMC's part. Instead, they've continually claimed that they base their recruiter raises, vacations, and bonuses on job knowledge, business practices, ethics, professionalism, and customer service, not just new student enrollments. I'd like to hope that those qualities at least contributed to how workers were treated and the pay they received, but as former employees, their statistics, and their own words show, EDMC's priority never lay with ethics. About another $100 million in outstanding loan debt in total was forgiven in addition to the almost $100 million settlement as part of the whistleblower lawsuit. EDMC really couldn't keep pretending everything was all right. And after about a year of everything blowing up in their face, they announced they were closing 22 of their 26 Brown Mackey locations. They still plan to teach out their current students at that point though, which means that current students can complete the course or transition to a mutually agreed course at no disadvantage to the student. For those students' sakes, I really hope they just left the school since it really doesn't seem like a Brown Mackey education is a respected one in the slightest at this point. EDMC also laid off more than 300 employees at this point, mainly in the online division and shut down 15 of their 52 art institute campuses. This slow and painful decline came to an end when EDMC was finally taken out of their misery, bought and declared bankruptcy. So let's finally get into the end of the scammy era. Dream Center, a faith-based nonprofit, bought up 31 art institute schools in early 2017 with the intention of converting all of the schools into nonprofits. After a complete and thorough examination of the three education systems in the Dream Center network to ensure they are meeting the needs of today's learners, we did not see demand growth for courses at these campuses, and Dean, a spokeswoman for Dream Center, told the Mercury News. This decision was made for a number of reasons, including a shift in demand for online programs in higher education and in student populations at the campuses, which have resulted resulted in declining unstable enrollment levels for campus-based programs in these markets. EDMC also filed for a chapter seven bankruptcy in Delaware in spring 2018, claiming to have less than 50,000 in assets and between 500 and $1 billion in debt. It seemed like their decline in students and the lawsuits hit them incredibly hard as it should. Students were given the option of transferring to other Dream Center schools or receiving a grant to an unaffiliated partner institution, or if they left completely, Dream Center offered loan forgiveness. Again, for their own sake, I hope these students took the latter option. Of course, even if they did, it still meant starting over completely and going elsewhere for the education they wanted in the first place. I literally wasted money from January until now, Mia Kimball, a student at the soon to shutter Illinois Institute of Art Chicago told the Chicago Tribune. I already spent $16,000 in credits that aren't transferable. It's a slap in the face. Who's to say I will be accepted in any of these schools? It's really discouraging. And Mia was not alone by any means. Other students such as Sean Joyce claimed that his debt was just a two year associate's degree and it was $90,000 and he'd been paying more than what was quoted to him. During enrollment, he was promised he would be able to find work related to his students, but employees at the career services department literally just sent him job links on Craigslist when he asked for help. He, along with 165,000 other students had to argue with the Department of Education, telling them to stop collecting on his federal loans because he was misled. Just because there was some loan forgiveness doesn't mean it was nearly enough to cover these scammy educations and the legal process has been painfully slow for many. In the end, many of these schools have closed, even the original Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Thankfully, there has been more talk of loan forgiveness in the works recently and October, 2019 documents have revealed that the education department provided almost $11 million in federal aid to two art institutes of Colorado locations, the Michigan location and the Illinois locations. Accreditation is supposed to affect the grants and government aid that a school can receive, but I guess in this case, EDMC managed to fool the education department or the department itself didn't take a closer look at these schools. I'm not certain exactly what transpired here and how they were able to get away with it for so long, but I'm really hopeful that the students who attended here were able to get something back. The EDMC has ultimately crumbled. The Dream Center also tried to buy the failing ITT tech schools, but that deal fell apart. I'm not exactly sure what the future holds with the Dream Center or all of these buildings, but it's incredibly upsetting how easy it was to defraud the Department of Education and the pushbacks against laws that could have protected victims against these for-profit colleges. Again, while I wasn't able to touch on every single detail of this case today, I still think it's, you know, it's definitely a lengthy one with many branches and many ways we can subsection this off and keep going forever and ever and ever 
ever, but I hope you can see at least in general terms that the issue with for-profit colleges, specifically looking at the EDMC and the Art Institute and the steps that they take to take advantage of anyone and everyone that they can. So with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to spend it here with me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.